view I have on occasionally, in my 46 years, I have occasionally injured myself. Never anything too serious, but I've scuffed myself up plenty of times in plenty of different ways. I broke my right arm one time, I had to wear a cast for about eight weeks. Broke my left hand one time, I had to wear a cast for about eight weeks. Broken each foot one time, was in a cast on the crutches for a while, you know that. You know, all four corners have been busted up at some point along the way. Broke some ribs on a parachute jump once, that was rather unpleasant. Cracked my skull in a car accident when I was about 12 years old. So I've got a scar running down the crown of my head. Now that my hair is thinning out so nicely, it's even more noticeable. I've got a scar about whoops, six inches down the crown of my head. Got another scar on my right knee from bashing into some rocks a while back. A couple of surgical scars where some skin cancers were cut off. Good that they can do that, I don't mind. I've got to have scars and skin cancer. Got about a dozen or so small scars on my hands from all the nicks and cuts and scratches and table saws that have come my way. It's a funny thing. You know, all those are painful. All of them hurt like the dickens when they happen. And then they heal up. And it feels fine. But the scars stay forever. Scars remain. Scars stay. And I'm sure that most of you have had your various share of broken bones and surgicals and injuries and ailments. Some of them far more extreme than I've ever had to deal with. Most of my things have been pretty minor. But it, it strikes me that we're pretty fragile. As you were resilient, but we're fragile. We can heal sometimes. We're never quite the same again. Even more interesting to me, not only the injuries that we take in the body, but the injuries that we take in the soul. The injuries that we take in our psyche, in our inner self. When we are betrayed by those that we trusted, that'll leave a mark every time, won't it? When we are hurt by those who love us, there are scars and wounds that no one can see. And I think those injuries are far more painful than any surgery you ever experience, yes? We are broken in the soul. There are scars in the inside of us, hurts and wounds. We don't quite function the way that we're supposed to carry those things. But it's praise to God, praise God for his healing power, his touch that brings us redemption. But like a, a scar in our skin, it doesn't quite feel the same. It doesn't quite work the same ever again. It's human nature to respond to the obvious. When a compound fracture in my leg happens, I'm pretty quick to go to the ER. Blood everywhere. That's an obvious thing to do, right? But when the injuries and the hurt are not so obvious, when it's hidden down within, we want to say, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. And I'll just walk it off. We shrug it off as though our hearts are invincible. We put on all our good psychological defense mechanisms to convince our own heart, we're okay, we're good, I'm just fine. Part of what I do in ministry is talk to people. And for whatever reason, people tend to share their secrets with me. And that's good. Because if you can't talk to your pastor, you're going to talk to them, right? And I assure you that your secrets are safe with me. But i got to tell you one thing. We're all broken. We're all broken in our heart. We all have hurts. We all have scars and wounds deep inside of us. And that starts with me, and that includes you, and all those people who act like they've got it all together all the time, they're broken too. And all the rest of this world in which we live, we are broken. Psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. Jesus comes to offer us healing and redemption and wholeness. And human nature says, oh no, I'm fine, I'm good, I'll just walk it off. 
rejoicing, the day of the triumphal entry. Jesus entering into Jerusalem on the back of a colt, and the crowds, they lined the streets to welcome him, to honor him. The Messiah had come, the Savior had come, and they laid the they tore the palm branches off the trees and they laid I wouldn't tear them. And they laid them on the, and they laid them on the streets and they threw their cloaks across the road. Matthew chapter 21, verse 8 and 9. A great multitude spread their clothes on the road, cut down branches from the trees, spread them on the road. The multitudes went before them. They cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. What a day of celebration. What a day of joy and rejoicing. The Savior has come to them. The Messiah of Israel. There's hope. Praise the Lord. Little did they know what the week had in store for them. Little did they know how quickly those shouts of joy and welcome and rejoicing in a couple of days, the whole tide was going to turn. And the words of Hosanna and praise would quickly become the call to crucify. Crucify him. Send us out Barabbas instead. Drop it, the blasphemer. Let it. Crucify him. Little did they know. But Jesus knew. Jesus knew all of what was going on that day. And he knew what was going to happen. And he understood the Father's plan unfolding it before him. And none of it was a surprise <laughs> to him. Turn your Bible, please, to Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44. You see, the cross did not sneak up on Jesus. The rejection of Israel was not a surprise to them. They didn't ambush him with their rejection. But I tell you this, it broke his heart. It broke our Savior's heart. The people that he came to, the very ones he came to redeem, rejected him. And Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God, the Almighty who come in the flesh, wept over his people. And the Lord cried tears of heartbreak over the city of Jerusalem and the brokenness of humanity. Let's read Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. Would you stand, please? In honor of the reading of God's holy word. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you. Surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave you in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, open our eyes today. Help us to see the brokenness. Help us to see the tragedy. Help us to see how this world has rejected their Messiah. And help us to be aware, Lord, of our time, of our visitation. Don't let us miss it. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. Jesus came to his own. Came into his own city, his own kingdom, his own people. They rejected him. They didn't understand. They didn't get it. 
They didn't see him for who he was. They did not realize the time of their visitation. They did not know that it is Jesus who comes to make their peace. John chapter 1 verses 9 through 11 tell us that he was the true light, which gives light to every man coming in the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Came to his own. His own did not receive him. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, cried tears of heartbreak over his people because they did not recognize their Lord, they did not see that their salvation had come. Jesus cries tears of brokenness, not over his own. Suffering, but over hours. And then this world's a broken place. Look around. Check out CNN. We are a broken people. And the results of the fall are far reaching. And all the human race is affected and infected with the deadly disease of a sinful, self-centered nature. Broken in the body, that's obvious. We talked about that. But broken in the soul, we're not what we're made to be. The results are obvious everywhere that we turn. As Jesus wept for Jerusalem, as the Savior was broken heart over the world, which he entered into, perhaps church. Perhaps we have some weeping to do as well. And perhaps the things that break our Savior's heart ought to break our hearts. Maybe we have some weeping to do. Maybe we can quit pretending that everything is fine. And I'll be all right. Let our hearts be broken over the world in which we live. I'm going to give you this morning some things to think about. There are wars and rumors of wars at every turn. Our nation, the United States of America, has been in continuous combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan for 12 years. 12 years. To date, 6,518 American service members have given their lives to that cause. Some estimates have said 10 times that number of civilians and enemy combatants have lost their lives. And thousands more than that have been wounded, injured bodily, and many thousands more than that have been emotionally scarred, beaten down by the violence and dealing with the after effects of what we call post-traumatic stress. That's a whole generation whose lives will be forever impacted by violence. And of course, before that, Bosnia, Somalia, Panama, Iraq the first time, Lebanon, Grenada, Vietnam, Germany, Japan, and on and on and on. We're a violent race. How many more lives are going to be cut off? How many more families forever shattered? I understand there is a price to pay for freedom. I get that part. I do not question the courage or the honor or the integrity of those who serve. I thank them and I salute them. But my heart breaks because of the violence that they endure. And even more heartbreaking is the fact that most of America is being paid attention. Unconcerned, so far away that it doesn't matter, and my life is too busy watching American Idol to worry about a war somewhere else. Maybe Afghanistan is too far away from you. Maybe we should be 
broken hearted over something a little close to home. Let me remind you of December 14th of last year. When a crazy person with a gun killed 20 first graders in Newtown, Connecticut. First graders. 20. Or a couple years ago down in Blacksburg. Where 33 people lost their lives. 17 were wounded. Or let me remind you about Chardon Ohio High School. Or Pearl City Middle School. Or Red Lake High. Or the University of Texas at Austin. Or Northern Illinois University. Or West Side Middle School. Or Columbine High. Or any one of 117 acts of violence committed in our schools since 1980. What is wrong with us? And why are we not weeping tears of brokenness? Maybe school violence is a little too far away for us to be personally affected. What about that family in your neighborhood? <laughs> Where those children get smacked around because dad drinks too much. And he's mad because he can't find a job. What about those relatives of yours where she takes one on the chin because dinner's late? What about those families that live in violence and fear every single day and cringe when the abuser walks in the door? You know people like that. Even if you don't know. Why do we have such violence? Jesus comes to offer us all healing and peace and hope. And we consist that we are just fine. And we continue on and act like everything is okay. We're broken. Where is our weakness? Look for the dope dealer to the crack house for the next fix that's really a 
Washington could create by spending money that we do not have, we are in a mess. And Jesus, the only hope that we have, the one who offers peace and grace and love, real healing in our soul, the world says, oh no, no thanks. The world longing for answers, longing for value, longing for meaning. And Jesus offers us himself. You know why the world says no thanks? The world, you know the world why it says never mind? They say, Jesus, no way, because I've already met some of his people. Church already been there. Because church, we're too worried about what color the carpet's going to be. We're too worried about who brought what to the last potluck. We're too worried about who's not giving enough to the building fund. Why don't they sing the music I like in church? That's what we're worried about. We point our finger of contempt and condemnation at all those who look different from us. We walk around in our self-righteousness, we criticize the sins of everybody else, and we ignore our own brokenness. We ignore our own faults and flaws and hurts. We ignore our own sin. We claim grace for ourselves and judgment on everybody else. That's why they don't come. That's why they've rejected Jesus. Because we are hard-hearted. Why are we not broken and weeping? Why are we not crying tears over the hurt and pain of sin? Not the sin of the world, our own sin, our own tragic lives. What is wrong with us? We become so content, so self-righteous in our self-salvation, that we lost sight about how badly, how desperately this world needs to know Jesus? Or do we just not care about the things the Savior cares about? Jesus wept over Jerusalem because they had rejected the one salvation that had come to them. And we ought to be weeping over this world as well. Look at verse 42 again. If you had known, if you had only known the things that make for your peace. He says the same to our world today. He says, world, if you had only known if you could only see the truth and majesty, the totality of the healing that he offers. If you could only stop and look and see. Church, if you could only get rid of your religion and your self-righteousness. If you could only seen the love that heals. If you could only seen the completeness of the salvation of your soul. Perhaps... You would allow yourself to be broken for a moment. Perhaps you would see all of who Jesus is. To see all of what he wants to do in your life. And you, church, would repent. Would repent and humble yourself and understand. For Jerusalem, they were day late and all short. Verse 43, too late. It's in from you. Days will come upon you. Your enemies are going to build an embankment around you and surround you and close you on every side of the level you and your children within you. And that prophecy was fulfilled just a few years after these events when the Roman legions besieged and sacked that city and destroyed the temple and laid waste. And the historians of the day record over a million people died. Heartbreak. Right? They didn't know the time of their visitation. They couldn't see it. And they missed it. The 
Jesus wept over his people. What do you suppose Jesus does when he looks at U.S. America today? When we continue in our rebellion, when we continue in our sin, we continue in our greed and our self-indulgence and our self-righteousness, we take what is wrong and we call it right and we redefine our world to suit our taste and our wants. And if we, church, you and I, if we are unaware of the time of our visitation, if we cannot make known His love and grace and healing power in this crazy world, if we are so impotent in our witness for the kingdom, why should He delay? Why should He wait another minute? Why should He hold back on His judgment? Because if the gospel is not going to move forward, why would He bother? Because I assure you this, when He comes back, He's not coming with grace and mercy. He's coming with a sword. He's coming in judgment. And it will be too late. And the world will not know the time of the visitation. Weep. Weep, church. Weep for the lost. Weep for the violence. Weep for the suffering. Weep for the innocent. Weep over sin and death and pain. Cry tears of brokenness for our world. Own up to your own sin, your own hard-heartedness. Be broken in your heart over the brokenness of humanity. And perhaps our sorrow, our humility, will lead us to repentance. And our repentance will lead us to action. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, you are awesome indeed. You are holy and you are righteous and you are full of grace and love and truth. The Lord, this world has rejected you. Help us to see your truth in a new way. Help us to respond with tears, with sorrow in our heart. Help us to respond with a new call to evangelism. Help us to respond with a new call to live lives of grace and love and healing and hope. Help us to be light in this dark world. That you, God, will be magnified in all of it. And the world will know you once again. Worship you and receive all that you have in store for us. We thank you. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We begin to close this morning. The altar will be open for prayer. The altar will be open. Perhaps we have some brokenness to deal with. Perhaps we need to respond in some way to what we've thought about this morning. Perhaps you didn't know that Jesus loves you so much and that he has healing in store for you. Your salvation to be made complete today. And that's you. I'd love to talk with you about it and pray for you and encourage you. Would you stand, please? That we would honor the Lord and respond to his call.